Good. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to another edition of Worldwide Wish, brought to you by the Wits Institute for Sport and Health at Wits University and the Faculty of Health Sciences. Uh, a great welcome to everybody who's joined us on a, on a Friday afternoon, which is a, a more unusual time for us, but uh, our guest is sitting seven time zones away uh, and uh, actually giving up some of his holidays, so we appreciate him being with us. Again, a, a very exciting talk that really fits in with the theme we've had over the last uh, couple of weeks in terms of youth sport and youth injuries, and we're delighted to have an expert to share his experience with us. I'm going to let uh, Dr. Robin Saggers, the uh, WISH Academic Director, introduce uh, Andrew Gregory in a minute. But really just to thank everybody who's helped with the webinar and also to our sponsor, uh, Lita Asino, the company that's come on board with a grant to help support the WISH initiative and academic program. So you know how it works by now. I think most of you have been on our webinars. Send your questions through on the Q&A facility on Zoom and we'll hopefully get through as many of those as possible at the end. Uh, and look forward to an engaging session uh, with Andrew sharing his experience with us and you having your questions answered. So thanks very much for your support. I'm going to hand over to Robin Saggers uh, and later to Hene Branders. Robin is the chair of the uh, Child Sports uh, or Youth Sports Injury Interest Group and Hene is the chair of the Schools Interest Group that we have under the banner of WISH. And just finally, to welcome our colleagues from SASMA, uh, many of whom are known to Andrew, uh, who's interacted over a number of years with, with SASMA. So welcome to all of you. I'm going to hand over to Robin and Hene and let them take it from here. Hi, John. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Like you said, um, I am a part of the, the Youth Sports Interest Group, and Hene, who's going to be co-chairing the session, is part of the School Sports Interest Group. And so we are very interested in children and sports, youth and sports, and school sports. And um, we're in particular interest of hearing from, back from you guys. Um, at the end of the webinar, I'll share some email addresses that you can get into contact with us and we can uh, form a relationship going forward. Enough about that, let's get over to our speaker. Um, our speaker is dialing in from around about the middle of the United States. Um, he's taking some time off um, on a holiday. Um, tomorrow is the 4th of July, American Independence Day. So we're very grateful for him to be here. Um, his name is Prof. Andrew Gregory. Uh, he's an Associate Professor of Orthopedics, Pediatrics and Neurosurgery at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. He's a Program Director for the Pediatric Sports Medicine Fellowship and Co-Director of the Vanderbilt Sports Concussion Center. Furthermore, he's also the team physician for USA Volleyball, Nashville Soccer Club, Vanderbilt University, and Nashville Christian High School. Regarding his background, Prof. Gregory first completed a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry at Indiana University and received his Doctor of Medicine from the University of Alabama School of Medicine. He then finished a pediatric residency at the University of Alabama in Birmingham before his fellowship in primary care sports medicine at the American School Medicine Institute, American Sports Medicine Institute. He joined the Vanderbilt faculty in August 2001, where he sees young sports medicine patients in the Vanderbilt Sports Medicine Center and the Pediatric Orthopedic Clinic at Vanderbilt Children's Hospital. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Andrew, I'm interested to hear, but while you're beginning to get your presentation queued up, I'm yeah. interested to hear what your average week looks like. Uh, so, um, as a clinician, um, I see patients in a couple of different settings. Um, one of those is the, uh, the children's hospital where we have um, a pediatric orthopedic clinic. So, we see not just young athletes, but... Uh, uh, children with all sorts of orthopedic problems like scoliosis and club feet and cerebral palsy. And then we have a, a sports medicine clinic that kind of sees all ages and um, so including adults and children. And so I'm in that clinic uh, a few days a week seeing just the younger patients. 
And then we've really moved to a satellite system where um, we have clinics that we're uh, kind of putting out in the communities. So one of them is closer to where I am now. And so uh, I go there one day a week where I have to drive about an hour to this clinic. Um, so in all of these settings, it's outpatient medicine. And most of them are either referrals from uh, general pediatricians, physical therapists, athletic trainers, or from some of the schools that we provide athletic trainers to. Great. I, I know that you're team physician for a number of um, schools and teams. Um, you, you work in some school sports environments and then all the way up to the Olympic athlete sort of level. Um, yep. can, you, can you talk to us a little bit about the range of athletes that you look after? Yeah, so uh, as a pediatric sports medicine provider, people always wonder, you know, how do I take care of professional athletes? And, uh, you know, you look at the soccer club and the volleyball players, and they're all kind of in their mid-20s, early 30s, and certainly the college athletes in their, you know, late teens, early 20s. And, um, you know, a, a lot of these athletes are kind of still myelinating their brains as, as our uh, – psychologists and psychiatrists will, will understand and so um, it's a very easy transition if you ask me that uh, that as pediatricians and pediatric providers we kind of have to know how to take care of pediatric problems and some adult problems as they make that transition for sure great um, thank you for that introduction let's um, hear what you have to say uh, over to you and we'll ask some questions and we'll take Q&A in the Q&A tab at the bottom thank you Great, thank you. Uh, so I'm gonna go through a, um, a bunch of pictures, uh, a lot of x-rays, and I'll try to sort of uh, explain things as we go through. And uh, I look forward to the Q&A at the end. So as far as disclosures go, I do serve on a number of uh, organizational committees and boards, and I'm an editor for Up To Date. And um, none of my comments today are representing these organizations. I would like to cover some specifics of pediatric bone, uh, in particular looking at fracture classification uh, and both acute and overuse injuries of these growth plates. So um, one of the big focuses of, of what I wanted to talk about today is, is the growth plate and how it can be injured. Uh, so one of the things that, that um, I wanted to kind of start off with is, is pitfalls, things that can get us into trouble. And if you've been taking care of young athletes, um, these things have seen you and hopefully you've seen them. So the jammed finger as it's referred to, you know, in a, in a child is usually a broken finger, whereas in an adult, it may be just a simple sprain. Uh, navicular fractures happen in children just like they do in adults. And I think sometimes um, that is forgotten. Uh, ACL tears, certainly all providers in sports medicine have to be familiar with that, but uh, I think um, sometimes in children aren't recognized because they can't explain uh, the mechanism maybe as well. Uh, a unique problem to children, which is the uh, stress fracture of the spine or spondylolysis, and then hip problems that are unique to kids with slipped capital femoral epiphysis and Perthes disease. Um, hide very well because the hip joint is, is hard to see and feel because it's covered up with muscle. And then uh, what I see a lot of every day, which is fractures that are um, not very visible on x-ray. So either a cult where you can't see them at all, very subtle, or a stress fracture that just hasn't shown up yet on x-ray. So some things that I think um, that, that uh, are important to consider is make sure you, you take a good history because a lot of times the child can tell you what happened if you listen. Uh, do a good exam uh, and read your x-ray, which are all kind of basic things. And so when people don't do those basic things, you can fall into this trap. And then I think one of the challenges for radiologists um, across the board is um, they have to know a lot of things about you know all AIDS patients and so uh, reading pediatric x-rays, if you don't do it on a regular basis, can be problematic. So what is different about the, the kid's skeleton? The, the bone is relatively elastic and rubbery, so it can actually bend a little bit without breaking. The nice thing is that the, the lining of the bone, the periosteum, is very vascular, and so it heals very quickly relative to adult bone. 
And then what is the main difference is that the, the presence of the growth plate or the physis is the weak link. And so the bone surrounding it is stronger and the ligaments surrounding it are stronger. And so if you have a, an injury, typically it's the physis that's injured. Uh, one of my mentors, uh, Neil Green, who wrote several of the uh, pediatric fracture textbooks, um, had this line, which is kids don't sprain stuff. So when you hear somebody who's coming in with a complaint, oh, I think they sprained their wrist or I think they sprained their ankle and it's a child, that's not very likely. So uh, if one takeaway from today, it's kids don't sprain stuff. And then one of the, the great parts about taking care of children is how quickly they heal and that they remodel. And I'm going to show you a, a nice picture of a, a fracture that has remodeled over time. Uh, so here it is anatomically, and I hope the cursor shows up uh, where you can see um, this is the end of a long bone, in this case, the hip. Uh, here is the physis. Here is the epiphysis, which is the joint side, and the shaft of the bone, which is the metaphysis, where it's becoming um, uh, a stronger bone. Meta is change. And the diaphysis, which is the cortical bone, the thick, hollow bone, it's very strong. And I think uh, most of us are aware of physis, but uh, there are multiple types of physis in the body. So the apophysis uh, serves as a muscle tendon attachment onto the skeleton. And so in this case, the hip, you can see there's one of the greater and lesser trochanter, both where muscle, uh, muscles attach. And so these other growth plates are really important, um, even though they don't contribute to the length of the bone. So they're subject to more uh, avulsion type injuries where uh, the, the growth plate at the end of the long bone is more of a compressive type injury. So what, what about these physes? So we're going to just um, look at it a little closer, but it's the primary growth center. You have cartilage cells on the epiphyseal side that is replaced by bone on the metaphyseal side. And you can see the, um, the range of closure uh, between boys and girls is wide and it's different for every bone. So when we talk about skeletal maturity, um, we refer to the majority of the bones, but there may still be other bones that are still open. Uh, in particular, the bones of the pelvis and the shoulder girdle stay open even into your early 20s. Uh, so here it is uh, blown up. So this is the epiphyseal side. You can see they start out as cartilage cells. They mature and transform into bony cells, and then they remodel in this uh, metaphyseal side. So uh, it's good to understand, you know, where we see the fractures is this, um, this early uh, zone where they're cartilage and naturally weaker than the bone. Uh, so we, we know um, kind of um, that, that it is weak. We know that the distal end of the long bone tends to fracture more commonly than the proximal and that we see these most commonly in the radius and the phalanges. So if you know that, uh, again, a wrist injury in a child, you should be suspicious of a physeal fracture of the distal radius. A jammed finger in a child, you should be suspicious of a, a physeal fracture of one of the phalanges. Uh, this is where it's clear that girls are smarter than boys, so two to one ratio of boys fracturing to girls. And again, you can see kind of the common uh, age with which we see these fractures is kind of the pre-adolescent age. And as I mentioned, some of the growth plates in the pelvis and the shoulder don't fuse until very late. Uh, so an, an easy way to sort of categorize things that I think is useful clinically is between the acute injury and the, and the chronic pain. And uh, sometimes young athletes and their parents have a hard time um, understanding kind of the overuse injury and oftentimes try to explain it with an acute injury. But uh, usually with a good focused history, you can differentiate the two. Uh, but in an acute injury, again, I would always be thinking fracture. In a chronic pain situation, I would be thinking about an injury to the growth plate, most commonly apophysitis, but certainly other conditions, as I mentioned earlier. So um, one of the things that we've learned about medical education is that we're not very good at teaching fracture classification. So I've tried to simplify things. Um, and this is how I really think about them uh, from a, a biomechanical standpoint as well. So uh, as you bend pediatric bone, it can kind of maintain that bend and we call that plastic deformation. That's most commonly in the fibula and ulna that is associated with a, a fracture of the other bones. The buckle or, or torus fracture where again, you bend the bone and on the compression side, you get a buckle uh, in the, the cortex, which I'll show you a picture of. 
a green stick fracture, which again, as you continue to bend the bone, you get the buckle on one side and then it cracks on the opposite side, on the tension side. And then as you continue to bend the bone, it, it breaks completely through and you get a complete fracture. And that can either be you know, transverse, obliquely oriented or spiral. So again, if you think of those in order, it makes sense. The further you bend it, the more severe the fracture is. And then there are the two specific fractures of the growth plate, either the physeal fracture, which we'll talk further about, or the popseal avulsion fracture that I mentioned. Uh, so Salter-Harris classification, um, I think um, we maybe sometimes get a little too caught up on what the number is and not understanding kind of the pattern. And to me, it's more important that you understand the pattern than you know the number. But I think if you look at this diagram, um, it, it, it is very, uh, simple to understand the, the fracture that goes through the growth plate only, the fracture that goes through the growth plate and the metaphysis. So these two are the most common fracture types. And so uh, that is the way I think about it. Is it a growth plate fracture and does it involve the metaphysis or does it involve the epiphysis? Because if it goes into the epiphysis, which is the type three and four, then it involves the joint that's obviously much more significant. So. If you can just simply say it's a growth plate fracture that does not involve the, the joint, uh, you've said the same information. A, a growth plate fracture that does involve the joint, uh, again, very important information, probably needs to be referred to a surgeon. Uh, the type five is the compressive injury. Uh, the, the reason it's important is because there's a high risk of growth arrest. A lot of times you can't see this on the initial x-ray, you treat them clinically and then they develop growth arrest later. So what about some, uh, some historical clues? And I'm sorry that that wording is covered, uh, but um, I've listed kind of the top three things. And so for our school uh, colleagues, um, these are all things you have to deal with on the playgrounds at schools, which is uh, the monkey bars. So the monkey bars here um, are one of our best sources of business. And that is because all the elementary schools have them on their playgrounds. And in order to uh, graduate from elementary school, you have to be able to cross the monkey bars. Uh, and, and everybody goes to all this trouble to put mulch and things underneath uh, the monkey bars, but very quickly what happens is all the mulch gets pushed out of the way, and so there's really no padding underneath. This idea that kids aren't good historians, um, I think comes from adults who don't understand kids. I think if you listen to them, uh, they know they know exactly what happened. Sometimes they're not willing to disclose what happened, but they know exactly what happened. And with uh, with the common fractures like buckle fractures, you may not have much swelling or bruising or deformity to help you see the the, the, the injury. And so, oftentimes, it kind of gets um, pushed aside as probably nothing because there's nothing visible. Uh, but kids will give you clues. So if uh, you have a young child who refuses to walk. Uh, or is limping, or a child that's protecting their arm, that's a good clue because kids just want to go about their business and they'll do that whatever way they can do. And oftentimes you can see how they're protecting an extremity. So let's go through some injuries. Um, we'll kind of go from uh, upper extremity to spine and then lower extremity. And so I'll try to point out growth plates. And one of the useful things I think in, um, in doing this work is kind of uh, just looking at a lot of x-rays and, and looking at growth plates so you can see what a normal one looks like because then it's easier to, to see the abnormal one. So uh, this is a, uh, an AP x-ray of the shoulder and you can see in this case uh, a normal growth plate of the proximal humerus. Uh, sometimes looks strange because there's two separate ossification centers here uh, but for those of you who are already kind of aware of this you can see a nice distal clavicle fracture. In this case, this is a CT scan, which I just included to show you that the, uh, the acromion has its own growth plate and the coracoid has its own growth plate, which you can't see very well in that particular view. So a, a condition that we see quite a bit uh, because of baseball, so also common in Japan and Central America, but maybe not so common in South Africa, uh, is little league shoulder. But certainly other sports, tennis and volleyball can, can cause the same thing, but it's usually just repetitive throwing usually more in males, so our, our female softball players who pitch underhand don't, don't see this injury, which is interesting. Uh, and it's just a, a product of too much throwing. So they, they throw and they develop shoulder pain, they stop throwing and their pain gets better. 
And so on exam, uh, not too surprisingly, they're tender over their proximal humerus. They may have some muscle tenderness in the pec minor. And as you fire the cuff against resistance, because the cuff is pulling on that growth plate, it does cause pain. Um, usually they have full motion unless they've been pitching for a while and, and they might lose some internal rotation. And not too surprisingly, just like in our adult or professional athletes, they develop scapular dyskinesia and whip, uh, weak hip abductors. And so uh, our physical therapy colleagues are very useful in my mind in teaching them how to um, address those weaknesses so that when they come back from their injury, they're uh, not only going to be recovered, but but stronger and probably throw harder. So on x-ray, this is quite easy to see, particularly if you get a comparison view of the opposite side. So a single uh, anterior posterior radiograph, usually with the arm and external rotation. Um, so in this case, this is a right-handed thrower. And you can see here is the, uh, the left uh, arm, uh, that kind of... Um, uh, uh, growth plate that looks a bit funny, but when you compare it to this side, you can see widening um, when you compare side to side. And, and this one actually has a little cyst formation. So, so one of the things to take away from this is widening of a growth plate um, shows injury. So Osgood Slaughter, which we'll touch on later, um, is probably the best example that people know about. When you see widening of that growth plate on the x-ray, it's indicative of a, a chronic injury or an overuse injury. Uh, in this case, the treatment is quite straightforward, which is rest from throwing until the pain goes away. Uh, we don't like slings because of weakness, and we certainly uh, are going to have them focus on their strengthening exercises while they're taking their time off. We don't follow x-rays because we know it takes a long time to, uh, to resolve. And then a return to throwing program. And I think uh, because of baseball, we've learned that uh, there are other sports that can benefit from a similar return to sports program. Uh, whether that's gymnastics, whether that's tennis, uh, whatever it may be to kind of gradually uh, increase over time. And then for prevention, really following pitch counts is the best uh, method uh, of preventing this in future because they are at risk for it until their growth plate closes. Uh, so moving down to um, the elbow, and I, I don't um, want to um, – kind of minimize the shoulder, but you know, certainly other injuries can happen and I'm not trying to be completely comprehensive, but give good examples of, of these things. So uh, the elbow is a, um, a joint that, that I think is challenging because of the number of growth plates, but there are a couple of clues that, um, that I'll give you that I think kind of simplify things. So uh, swelling is one of those clues. So oftentimes you can see the swelling on exam uh, but you can also see it on x-ray. Uh, but on exam, if you have swelling, you lose flexion extension. Interestingly, it does not affect supination pronation. So, so if they have trouble with flexion extension, immediately I'm worried they've got swelling. And if they have swelling, that's usually indicative of a fracture. So on x-ray, um, if you look at this, um, the, the swelling shows up um, not as the fluid, which is the same density as the soft tissue, but the fat pads that get pushed away from the humerus. In this case, the anterior fat pad you can see as a sail sign or being pushed away from the bone is abnormal. Uh, you cannot see the fracture in this particular patient. I know this is a young patient because you can only see two of the ossification centers. And so age is very helpful. If you see this in a younger patient, school age patient, that's usually a supracondylar fracture. In an older patient, like an adolescent or an adult, oftentimes that's a radial head fracture. In this case, uh, you, can, you can see that slightly. Uh, so here are those ossification centers, and, and I point them out just to show you that they appear in an order and then they disappear in a different order, which makes it all very confusing. And so um, I, I tell people not to spend too much time trying to memorize the ossification centers, but just realize that uh, there is an order to it and it's ever unclear as to whether that's a growth plate or not. You can always x-ray the other elbow for comparison. Uh, but uh, capitellum's first, followed by radial head, followed by the meat epicondyl followed by the trochlea, the olecranon, and then the external or lateral condyle. And then these three fuse together uh, to become one and then fuse to the humerus, followed by the olecranon, the radial head, and then the last one to close is the medial epicondyle. And that's important because throwers can have an injury to that uh, well into their secondary school or high school uh, years. Uh, so here is that injury. That's the medial epicondyle avulsion. So you see two different uh, uh, avulsion fractures. In this case, 
all the other ossification centers of the elbow are fused, but the medial epicondyle is still open and you can see this callus where this fracture is starting to heal. In this case, this is a much younger child, so you can see there's only these three ossification centers present and you can see separation here, so this is widened. So this one might require surgical fixation. Uh, an example of a, a missed fracture, so um, this is an AP and a, a lateral view, and this is a nice kind of demonstration of that physeal fracture classification we were talking about where here's the growth plate, here's the epiphysis, this is the joint, and the fracture is on this metaphyseal side uh, where there is some early callus formation. So again, a fracture through the growth plate that doesn't go into the joint, this will heal very well with just conservative management. So initially with any of these injuries, if, if you see this, uh, it's appropriate to splint them, let the swelling go down before casting them. Uh, if they're non-displaced, most of these will heal just with simple casting. Uh, I mentioned um, throwers in the shoulder, the same kind of phenomenon happens in the elbow with throwers from a, a valgus stress from throwing, usually at a younger age than um, the shoulder. And there is that valgus stress where you um, open up on the medial side and compress on the lateral side. They're, they're very tender on their medial epicondyle. They may have hypertrophy of it, just like you see in Osgood Slaughter. And just like you see with the shoulder, you see widening of that growth plate. If this injury goes on, you can develop a flexion contracture where they're unable to straighten their arm all the way and eventually even a valgus deformity and possibly uh, OCD of the, uh, the capitellum. So here's a couple of elbow x-rays of uh, young throwers who have medial elbow pain. In this case, you can see the hypertrophy of the medial epicondyle. All the other growth plates are closed. In this case, you can see wide open growth plates and this growth plate is now fragmented. So the reason that's useful to know is that um, when this goes on to fuse, this may not, and then you end up with continued elbow pain throwing. Similar to, um, uh, our shoulder uh, discussion, rest from throwing is really the treatment, address their mechanics and same physical therapy uh, issues, gradual return to throwing, same kind of prevention measures. And again, if the displacement is significant, um, just like in the extra I was showing you, uh, surgery may be indicated. So that is when you want to involve your orthopedic surgical colleagues. Um, Moving on to, uh, again, a, a, a condition that you have to be aware of in young kids, which is the nursemaid's elbow. We may have to change the name depending on uh, what area of the world you live in, whether this is nanny's elbow or au pair's elbow. But this is the younger child who um, doesn't want to go and you're holding onto their arm and they're pulling one direction and you're pulling the other and, and then a pop is felt. Uh, the most recent story I heard was a girl who was at the beach and they buried her in the sand and then they tried to lift her out of the sand by her arms and uh, fell to pop. And um, the kid will cry immediately. Immediately they will not use their arm. You look at their elbow and there's no swelling or deformity and if you leave it alone that it doesn't get better. They don't, they don't begin to use their arm. So this is a, a subluxation of the radial head that occurs because of a tear in the annular ligament which then slips into the joint and gets compressed. And so any motion, particularly supination, pronation is painful. Uh, it occurs in toddlers and, and up to around age eight. And then what happens is the, uh, the bone changes shape. So the end of the bone that is smooth initially becomes more hammerhead shaped and then the, the annular ligament can't slip off. So here it is uh, diagrammatically, you, you pull on the, uh, the forearm, you develop this tear um, there is separation, you let go of the forearm and then the annular ligament is trapped here, which is what causes the pain. There, there were some sound effects. As far as reduction maneuver, there's really two. And um, what, what I teach um, our uh, young residents is that pick one way and do it well. And if you do it well, it's, it's, it's usually successful. Uh, in this case, I teach the supination flexion method, so full supination of the wrist followed by full flexion of the elbow. You, you can place your hand on the elbow, which doesn't actually do anything. You're not pushing the radial head back in. It's just so you can feel the pop, and the pop is very subtle. It's almost just like a click, like with your, your tooth like that. It's not a clunk or a, a loud noise, but uh, oftentimes you can feel it. Um, 
the main thing to know about that is your risk of recurrence is high. And so, you know, we teach people not to lift them up by their arms and, and we'll even show the parents the redu reduction maneuver. Uh, moving on down uh, to the forearm, um, certainly one of the uh, most common fractures, as I mentioned early. Uh, what's interesting is if you look at some data out of uh, the Midwestern United States, this, this fracture seems to be becoming more common, whether that's because of obesity or poor dietary habits is unclear. Um, most common mechanism is a fall on an outstretched hand, which you'll see over and over again as the mechanism. So any kind of fall in a child can cause this. Usually it's associated with running. And again, there may not be any obvious clues, but they're very tender on the end of their radius. So if you feel on your own radius, you can feel the radial styloid. And if you just come back about a centimeter or an inch or so, um, you're gonna be on the physis. So unfortunately the physis is not palpable. Uh, you just have to know uh, where it is. And as I mentioned, they may have full motion or they may lose that supination because it's painful. Uh, this is a classic bruise. So uh, when you scrape up your hand, um, you know, you, you see the bruising in the hand, but if you see this bruise over the forearm here, that's indicative of a distal radius fracture. Uh, so here's a good example of one. So um, you can see open physis of the, uh, the distal radius and ulna. In this case, you see a little bit of callus here on the distal radius. So this was a child who uh, who had an injury, um, was not seen initially because the parent didn't think it was anything significant, but had continued pain and then had a second fall and was reporting more pain. And so came in for their x-ray at about two weeks and you can see this one's starting to heal. So this would be a fracture just through the physis. More commonly, we see this Salter Harris II fracture or a fracture through the physis, which then goes through the metaphysis. And so uh, when you look at these x-rays, this is what I tell people to look for, is this little kind of deformity on the, uh, the metaphysis that's close to the physis. So if I see anything on the metaphyseal side that's close to the physis, I'm assuming it goes into the physis. Whereas buccal fractures tend to happen more proximally, and I'll show you pictures of those. So again, just like the, the one we talked about where you'd push on this, they would have tenderness uh, right there. Um, I like this uh, series because this is one of my neighbor's kids and uh, she fell uh, riding her bike, uh, broke her wrist. You can see um, this nice little metaphyseal piece. You can see this was displaced a little bit dorsally. She went to the emergency room where one of our uh, residents tried to reduce it and you can see uh, their attempt was not successful. So they pushed on this, but it didn't really move. And we said, okay, you can, you can stop. You can see the splint is in place. This is her a month later after being in a cast and you can see callus where it's healed, right? And you can see it's healed in this abnormal position. And then here's her x-ray six months later uh, after the remodeling process. So with us doing nothing, but just giving it time, as this physis grows, it's able to remodel and straighten, straighten itself out. So it's an amazing kind of thing to see and it's unique to children. So. Uh, this same fracture in an adult that would require surgery and a child doesn't because of this remodeling process. Uh, and this girl is now in, in medical school. Uh, moving on to the buccal or torus fracture. Um, as I mentioned, you can see this fracture is a little further away from the growth plate. So down here, more at the metaphyseal junction. So this is where this bone is, um, is more spongy and, and no real cortex to where it's transitioning into this cortical bone. Uh, I'm gonna move inside since we got some noise here. Sorry about that. So it's, uh, it's named for the, the buckle, um, like a buckle in the carpet or a uh, torus, the Greek column. And that's the same same fracture, just multiple names. Um, Evidence-based medicine now teaches us that uh, uh, splints uh, work just as well for casts for buccal fracture of the disarray. So there's now three randomized controlled trials that demonstrate uh, no difference in pain, better function, no, no need for a return for cast removal or re-x-ray. So this has really changed our practice in the last 10 years where uh, we have, um, these kids uh, seen initially given a splint and they really don't need any follow-up. So this is something that can easily be followed in a, a general pediatrics office if you have access to these splints. Uh, 
and it, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, uh, navicular fractures or scaphoid fracture, if you prefer that term, happen in skeletally immature kids. So here's an example where you can see the, uh, the growth plate, the dysphoreus is open, and here's a mid-waist navicular fracture. Uh, here again, open growth plate, and this is more of a proximal pole navicular fracture. And unlike the buccal fracture of the uh, distal radius that I think um, um, can be managed in a general practitioner's office, this is a surgical problem. Uh, these proximal pole ones really don't heal well because the blood supply comes in distally. So these are gonna get surgery. These mid-waist ones may or may not heal. So sometimes we'll attempt to let them heal in a cast, but they heal very slowly. So more like the three or four month mark as opposed to like the three or four week mark in a distal radius. Uh, this is how you diagnose it, is finding your snuff box. So if you extend your thumb, uh, finding those two tendons, you then have the patient relax their thumb and, and place uh, your finger right on the X. Uh, as far as treatment of that, I would put them in a, a thumb spike, a splint. And again, I would refer these because a lot of them are going to get surgery. Uh, moving on to another overuse uh, condition called gymnast wrist. And... Um, um, I, I would say this is um, a problem that, that um, is recognized in the gymnastics world. In, in our kind of area of the country, we have competitive cheerleading now where tumbling has become a big part of what they do, and I think it's less well recognized in that group. And so you could call this cheerleader's wrist as well, but it's from weight bearing on the arms, usually with tumbling, and it's a repetitive injury. They present with wrist pain. Um, most of our tumblers have a dominant side, and so it's, it's usually unilateral, but it can be bilateral. And if you palpate over their distal radius, it's tender in the same place, just like where you, fr where you fracture it. They have full motion. And then the concern with this is damage to that, that radial growth plate, which then can affect its growth. And then the ulna continues to grow, and you get what's called positive ulnar variance, where the ulna is too long, and it compresses that cartilage in your wrist, the triangular fiber cartilage complex. So if you do an ulnar carpal impingement test where you have them ulnarly deviate their wrists, oftentimes it causes a lot of pain on the ulnar side. So you'll see the common theme coming out here on x-ray. You can see this with widening of that growth plate. So when you push on the distal radius here, it's painful, and you can see the space looks wide when you compare it to the, uh, the distal ulna. If in this case, you can see the distal ulna and the distal radius are the same length, so they do not have ulnar variance, but as this grows, even two millimeters long, you can see how it increases the load on the ulnar side significantly and, and uh, injury to that TFCC. Uh, here's an example of, of positive ulnar variance. So you can see here on the end of the distal radius, um, the ulna is longer probably by about five millimeters. You can see the physis of the distal radius here is closed, whereas this is open. So if you're astute, you notice this child has an ulnar styloid fracture. So this is probably from a fracture, not from overuse, but just a good example of what it looks like. So what do we do about it? Just like with our throwers, we have them avoid weight bearing, but I really like the term relative rest. So um, just like in baseball, we'd allow them to bat and we'd allow them to run. For our gymnasts and our tumblers, we would allow them to uh, to do bars and jumps, so front flips, back flips are all okay, just no weight bearing on the arms. There are some braces called tiger paws, but there's really no good evidence um, that they work, but it's certainly something you could try. And again, the problem is once this ulna is long, uh, there's really no way to reverse it other than surgery. Uh, so this is that um, same patient where you can see um, the ulna has been um, uh, cut here, shortened, and, and now the, uh, the distal ulna and the distal radius are better aligned. Moving on down into the hand. Um, if you uh, remember <coughs> uh, that the growth plates are all proximal in the phalanges, uh, in the metacarpals, they're all distal with the exception of the first metacarpal, which is proximal. So some people believe that the, the first metacarpal is actually a phalange based on where the growth plates are. So the reason that's helpful is it helps you figure out where the fracture is if you know where the growth plates are. In this case, there's a fracture here, the fifth metacarpal distally. Uh, you can see all um, finger fractures are not the same, and so x-ray is really helpful in sorting this out. And so in my mind, the jammed finger in a child deserves an x-ray because 
Some of them are going to be treated simply with buddy tape. Some of them are going to require surgery. So you can see this is a flexor tendon avulsion in a, in a patient with closed growth plates, an ulnar collateral ligament avulsion in a patient with closed growth plates, and this is an ulnar collateral physeal uh, avulsion in a patient whose growth plate was still open. Um, haven't talked a lot about malalignment, so the, the fractures that are displaced are usually much more obvious and easy to see because of the deformity. In this case, you can see, again, a metaphyseal piece of this, um, a physeal fracture, and where the, um, the, the proximal and distal phalanges are, are deviated towards the radius. So um, one of the questions that comes up is, um, you know, how much uh, malalignment do you accept? And um, in my mind, if, if the extremity doesn't look straight, you should attempt to straighten it. Oftentimes the child does that without thinking about it. They, their fingers point in the wrong direction. They, they pull on it and straighten it out or somebody does that for them. And as long as it's straight, um, that's all that matters. It doesn't matter who does it. Um, but in this case, this would require um, a reduction maneuver. Here you can see the, uh, the same injury in the ring finger, both before and after reduction. Again, with these growth plates being proximal, that's where the injury is. Uh, jumping now to the spine um, and uh, a, another injury that's unique to kids that um, uh, you really don't see in adults, which is a stress fracture of the spine. I'm not big on Latin terms, but I think it's, it's worth understanding. Uh, spondylolysis, spondy spine lysis is cut. So this would be a single uh, pars defect, so on one side only. Uh, in this case, the thesis is slip. So in order to have a slip, you have to have a fracture on both sides of the spine, and then you get separation. This is very visible on a lateral x-ray. So the utility in getting x-rays in, in my mind is to see this uh, listhesis. It's very hard to see a, a unilateral um, lysis on one uh, x-ray. So how common is this? Um, it is not unusual to find in um, asymptomatic people. So they come in for an x-ray uh, for uh, an injury reason or something and you find the spondy and then you have to determine whether that's what's causing their symptoms or not. But very common in active adolescents. So uh, Lyle McKaylee was the first um, person to kind of publish on this in the US now 30 years ago. And in his group, which was a lot of dancers and figure skaters, the, the incidence was about 50%. There are now several other studies looking at incidents in different uh, sports. And, and we see now it's kind of a range from 30 to 50%, depending on what sports you see. So um, very important to look for uh, in this active adolescent group. Um, so, so something we all need to be aware of um, who are treating back pain. Um, most commonly in the adolescent age group, most commonly at the L5 level, and again, certain sports seem to be higher risk, but can happen in, in any sport. As far as diagnosis goes, I mentioned x-rays are a real challenge, so uh, there are a couple of systematic reviews now showing that oblique views of lumbar spine are really not very uh, helpful because of their poor sensitivity, and so most of us uh, do a simple lateral view looking for um, uh, the spondylolisthesis or slip. And then we use some sort of advanced imaging. In, in our world, MRI seems to be the best because of its sensitivity and specificity, including stir imaging is, is really helpful. Um, bone scan, which is what was used primarily when I trained, is, is still very helpful uh, in determining if the lesion is active. It's still very helpful in, in our athletes who can't have MRIs for whatever reason because of metal. But we have gotten away from CT scan because of the high radiation load. So um, we only really use those if we have um, uh, patients that we're concerned about they didn't heal later on. So we're not using them for diagnosis anymore. So again, if you're going to work it up, I would say a single lateral uh, x-ray and then either an MRI or a bone scan, depending on what is available where you are. This is why this is so challenging. So this is an oblique view and um, people um, talk about the Scotty dog with the ear, the snout, the front leg, the belly the back leg and the tail. And you can imagine if you put stool or gas over this, it's just very challenging to see this, this defect. So that's why we've gotten away from it. Here's an example of an MRI, and this is a stir sequence, stir sagittal. In this case, you can see the normal uh, bone here, whereas the abnormal bone here has edema in it, and here is the uh, lesion. 
uh, bone scan just to show you kind of how uh, it's still useful, but maybe not as, uh, as great detail. So this is an L3 bilateral uh, pars fracture. So you can see on the uh, coronal views that it lights up on both sides and on the axial view with the vertebral body here in the spinous process here, you can see the pars lighting up on both sides. CT scan, again, just really for educational purposes, we don't do this anymore. Um, you can see here is a bilateral pars fractures and this is with um, them healed. So um, for a while, people were advocating getting CT scans before returning people to play to prove that they're healed, but we've really gotten away from that. What to do as far as treatment? Um, this is a, an area of controversy, uh, depending on where you are, uh, people recommend different things. I think uh, universally, however, uh, physical therapy for hamstring flexibility, back strengthening, core strengthening is all gonna be very helpful as long as you avoid the painful positions, typically that's extension. Uh, but what, what I think is really shouldn't be recommended is bracing and no physical therapy because we know what's gonna happen to your musculature if you do that. Uh, certainly any activity that's painful should be restricted. And if you're gonna use bracing, unfortunately you're committing to a, a long time, just like scoliosis bracing. So we've really gotten away from bracing um, if I have somebody who I can't control their pain with rest, then I might consider it, but I haven't done that in a very long time. There is some evidence that a bone stimulator may be helpful. Um, the, the problem with these is these are quite expensive and most insurance companies are not going to pay for them. So unless you can buy a second hand one online, it's not something we're normally using. Moving on down to the lower extremity. Um, I mentioned that the hip and pelvis is a good place to hide injury. And um, similar to the elbow, there's a lot of growth plates. And so um, a, a lot of things to sort of understand. And then there's a lot of muscle groups that attach uh, at these apophyses, like I was mentioning early. Um, so in this case, this is an AP view of the pelvis. And when, whenever I uh, tell people to get x-rays, I would always get pelvis over hip because it gives you both sides for comparison. And you can see in this side, there's initial tuberosity. Uh, that's different than the opposite side. So this is a chronic injury to this ischial tuberosity. In this case, you can see the uh, iliac crests are open. Uh, once you reach skeletal maturity, these iliac crests close. So that's very helpful on a spine view to be able to look at that uh, for things like scoliosis. So this is one of those conditions not to miss. This is one of the few things in the orthopedic world that's going to get surgery every single time. So uh, this is an injury through that physis of the proximal femur and should be considered in any child or adolescent who has uh, either a limp um, as their sole complaint or hip or knee pain. And I'm amazed still how oftentimes this happens where they come in with knee pain, the knee gets examined and x-rayed and nothing is found and yet the problem is coming from their hip. So uh, I have a very low threshold for getting pelvis x-rays if somebody comes in with knee pain and limp. Our whole goal is to catch it before it slips and um, there's a high risk of this being bilateral. And so oftentimes we are um, very sensitive about the other side and if they have any pain at all, fixing the other side. So all of these are gonna get open reduction internal fixation 100% of the time. If you're suspicious of this, they should be on crutches until they see the surgeon. So uh, this is a hip x-ray. Uh, this is a, a slipped uh, head here. You can see the ice cream has fallen off the cone. We can't feel good about this diagnosis because this is too late. You can't put the ice cream back. It can only be fixed in position. Whereas on this x-ray, this is a frog leg pelvis. And I do think the frog leg view can be helpful in, in diagnosing this. And if you look at the growth plate, you can see just like we were talking about with other injuries, there's widening of this growth plate. And then if you draw a line on the super aspect of the femoral neck, the line passes through normally part of that growth plate. In this case, the line doesn't pass through any part of it. And so this ice cream is melting, but hasn't slipped off. So if we get this kid to surgery and pin this in place, we've saved their hip. Whereas if, it, if this occurs, it's, it's really too late. Um, other um, common conditions are this uh, kind of chronic overuse um, uh, hip or pelvic pain that can occur primarily with running, but other things like jumping. So. Right now, while the sports are out, we have a lot of kids jumping on trampolines, and we see a lot of trampoline injuries, and this could be just a simple overuse injury. Uh, 
uh, repetitive kicking can cause the same thing. Sometimes there is a, a sudden onset where they feel a pop and they can no longer run or kick. And that's a true avulsion fracture versus an overuse uh, injury. The nice thing is most of these bony prominences where these growth plates are, are palpable. There are some that are not. And then if you understand your anatomy, doing stretching or firing of the muscle that attaches there can be helpful in the diagnosis. Again, we're looking for widening of that physis on x-ray. So um, all of these bony prominences have growth plates associated with them and all of them have muscle tendon attachments. So I, I like using this because this is my anatomy textbook from medical school. And I think it's funny because I, I highlighted everything because it's all important apparently. Um, but it just shows you some good origins and insertions. And I'll just show you a couple that I think are important. Here's the rectus at the anterior inferior iliac spine, which is just adjacent to the acetabulum. So when you palpate your anterior superior iliac spine, which everybody can feel in their own pelvis, you know that the anterior inferior iliac spine is just below it, but it's unfortunately not palpable. Greater trochanter palpable where your glute um, medius and minimus attach. Ischial tuberosity palpable where your adductors and your hamstrings attach. Lesser trochan are not palpable where your ileus psoas attaches. So again, it's a common injury um, that you can't unfortunately put your finger on. Um, again, seeing these origins and insertions, very helpful when you're looking at your x-ray. So we'll look at some uh, x-rays of these injuries. Uh, AP pelvis, you can see in this case that the femoral heads are closed. Uh, greater trochan or lesser trochan are closed, but the uh, iliac crest and ASIS still open. And so this was a dancer who was just having hip pain from a repetitive kicking. There's that growth plate. Uh, this was a uh, baseball player who was running to first base and had a, a immediate onset of pop and pain and could no longer run. You can see on his um, AP pelvis that his proximal femur is still open, his greater trochanter is still open, his triradiate cartilage is still open, and he has an avulsive injury here uh, at the anterior inferior spine. You can see the difference side to side. There it is in close up. Uh, this was a, a gymnast who was practicing her splits over and over and had pain, tenderness on her ischial tuberosity, tenderness with hamstring uh, stretching. And you can see this open growth plate here, different from the opposite side. So again, proximal femur, greater trochanter closed, but this is still open. Um, this was a, um, a American football player who was running at practice, felt a pop and couldn't run anymore. Uh, pain with resisted hip flexion, couldn't hold his leg up. No real palpable pain, but on his AP radiograph, you can see here how his lesser trochanter has been pulled off. Moving on down to the knee, and we'll finish up with the knee and ankle. Um, uh, the knee, I think, is a, a bit easier than the, the hip and the elbow because it doesn't have as many growth plates. So again, you have a growth plate distal femur, proximal tibia, uh, proximal fibula, and then you may or may not see growth plates on the patella. So um, one of the clues in the knee, just like in the elbow, is swelling. In this case, you can see the swelling. You don't look for the fat pad. You can actually see the fluid. So the distal femur um, could be injured um, uh, quite commonly with a valgus type uh, mechanism or a hyperextension mechanism. So in, in our world, that's usually American football. In your world, that's going to be rugby. Uh, where they get struck from the lateral knee in an adult would cause an MCL injury in a child because the MCL is so strong and it originates on your uh, distal femoral epiphysis, it puts the distal femoral physis at risk. The challenge for us is the x-ray may be normal and so you have to know where to palpate. So if you find the joint line and you come back, um, you know, one inch or a couple centimeters, you're going to be on that physis and then if you valgus stress it, it's going to cause them pain. Uh, here is a stress view, and, and I put this on there just for educational purposes. I don't advocate we do this because it is painful to do this, but you can see uh, here is the injured child with no stress, and then when you put stress to it, you can see how it's opening up. So I'm looking for pain with palpation, pain with valgus stress, and then fluid in the joint. And this is the reason why we are so concerned with this, because this is very high risk to fuse, and if this fuses, it really affects the growth of your uh, lower extremity. So if you take these two growth plates, the distal femur and the proximal tibia, they make up the, the majority of the growth in the lower extremity. So that's why we follow these along and we're so careful. So in this case, you can see this one arrested and this is the normal one. Because Salter 1s and 2s are so common, this is what we see these um, physeal arrests most commonly with them. <clears throat> 
Uh, here's an example um, of a, uh, a physeal injury that goes into the joint. And so I mentioned that distinction in classification. If you can say as a physeal injury and involves the epiphysis, um, this is going to change treatment because we can't allow any of that joint to be um, disrupted. And so in this case, you can see a, a screw that's placed across without disrupting the, uh, the distal femoral physis in order to align the joint. So again, fracture involving the joint needs a different treatment. Uh, here's an avulsive type injury of the tibial tubercle. So you can see forceful contraction of the quad. This piece of bone uh, should be down here. So you can see how it's retracted. So this is going to require surgery. Uh, there used to be a, a period of time where we were shutting people down if they had Osgood slaughter because we were worried that they might develop this injury. And the risk is really minimal. What's, what's more common is they develop an ossicle, which I'll show you a picture of later, that um, that, that would need to be addressed. So we aren't necessarily shutting people down with Osgood slaughters because of this. But if it's displaced like this, this is going to require surgery. If it's non-displaced, a lot of times it can be treated in a knee immobilizer. Uh, here's the proximal tibia. Again, just showing an injury to that to, to be aware. These are oftentimes subtle. Here's that little piece of metaphysis. So fracture goes through the physis. There's a little bit of separation here. Uh, but this child's going to have a lot of pain if you find the joint line and palpate about an inch below the joint line. Osgood slaughter, I mentioned to me, this is something we're all very familiar with, with a prominent tibial tubercle that's painful in adolescence. Oftentimes they come in with trauma uh, to it as they're presenting um, symptom and they're point tender on it. They're point tender with stretching or firing and, and usually their flexibility is bad. So again, this is one of these things where our physical therapy or um, athletic training colleagues can be very helpful in working on flexibility. Uh, here's that attachment of the uh, patellar tendon uh, on that tibial tubercle. Uh, here's the widening that you see classically. So this can oftentimes be diagnosed on x-ray. In my mind, the x-ray is useful to determine is the growth plate open, is there widening, and is there an ossicle? And so even though you might not need it for diagnosis, it might give you some prognostic information. And the same thing can happen at the inferior pole of patella. So uh, patellar tendon spans both. There can be a growth plate here and that can be irritated. So this is not an avulsive injury. This is a, a chronic injury in this particular athlete. What's the treatment? Um, a standard kind of um, uh, rice. Um, you can try straps or pads if you're a volleyball player. Working on flexibility, as I mentioned, understanding this is going to be a problem with, for them until they reach skill and maturity. And then really the only ones who need surgery is once their growth plates are closed, just like in this patient, but yet they have this persistent painful ossicle. So removing that ossicle will help their pain. And then finally, foot and ankle, which is what we'll end up with. Um, very common injuries in sports, just like we're familiar with ankle sprains in adult patients. Uh, this physis of the distal fibula is particularly at risk because of where these lateral ankle ligaments attach and are very strong. And so when you invert the ankle, the injury tends to be here at the distal fibular physis. Uh, the external rotation stress test can be very helpful if it's positive. Understand that the tibia closes before the fibula. So uh, the tibia can be protected and yet the fibula is still at risk. Uh, so here's another stress view, just like we were looking at in the knee where the distal tibia is closed, the fibula is open. This patient's very tender on their distal fibula. And if you invert them, you can see this opens up because the ligaments are holding down here. Uh, there is a physis on the medial malleolus. So oftentimes these can be confused with uh, avulsive injuries. So if you just have a single x-ray here, you might assume this has been pulled off, but when you x-ray the other side, you can see it's, it's normal. Uh, again, common to have these five seal injuries that are not very visible on x-ray, so we're just diagnosing them clinically. So this was a soccer player who had an injury that was very tender, didn't want to walk, and so put him in a walking boot for a month, and you can see now how he has callus around that, even though we couldn't see it initially. Psalter 2 injury, again, looking for that uh, metaphyseal piece that does not involve the joint, very common. And then this is a unique injury in our adolescence where that growth plate of the tibia is closing medial to lateral, but it's still open lateral. So you can see the, the physeal fracture going into the joint here. So again, this is one that's going to need to be referred. You can see how it's going up in this direction too. So again, if it involves the joint, we need to involve our surgical colleagues.
Uh, heel pain in this age group, very common cause is calcaneal apophysitis, which is heel pain with activity not associated with swelling. They're very tender on the bone. They have a tight calf that needs to be addressed, usually in this pre-adolescent uh, age group. In this case, the x-rays are usually not helpful for diagnosis, but again, just determining whether the growth plate is open. And um, your Achilles tendon, this is one of the times when I think Netter got it wrong, actually inserts way down here uh, distally at that growth plate. So here is uh, the growth plate here. Again, just determining whether the growth plate's open or not is helpful uh, to say whether this problem is gonna persist. So stretching of the calf, a standard treatment with, um, with ice and anti-inflammatory and rest, really not common to avulse this. Uh, I mentioned calcaneal fractures just because they can be hard to diagnose. So the classic story is somebody jumps into shallow water and, and lands uh, on their feet and immediately has heel pain or if they jump from a height like over a fence. And because this uh, calcaneus, the bone is cancellous, uh, doesn't have a thick cortex, it's very hard to see the fracture. So uh, in this case, this, this patient had a lot of pain with calcaneal squeeze was placed in the boot and then here's the x-ray four weeks later where you can see this clear sclerosis. If you look back at it here, you can barely see it. And then just as a reminder, the growth plates in your feet are just like your hands where um, uh, proximal on all the phalanges and the first metatarsal distal on all the other metatarsals. There are some um, common uh, ossicles in the foot. So here's an os naviculari, and this is a, uh, a, an os perineum. Iceland's disease is an overuse injury of the lateral foot at the peroneus brevis tendon attachment on that fifth metatarsal, but you can't have an acute injury uh, when you turn it over. So here's some, some different pictures. You can see this physis is fusing. Here's an open physis, and then here's the avulsive injury. So I know that was a lot of pictures, but um, hopefully it gave you a taste of um, what to be on the lookout for and how these growth plate injuries are very common and we should be suspicious of. So kids are not small adults. They don't sprain things. Be very suspicious of fractures or overuse injury of the growth plate. I mentioned the pitfalls to be on the lookout for things you really don't want to miss. So with that, I'll end. This is what I like to do in my pastime. This is how I quarantine. Uh, this is my daughter doing some snowboarding. I know you guys are uh, reaching this time of year. Um, and so uh, I'll put our website on there just as a good resource for injury prevention information, and then I'll uh, open things up for questions. Thanks, Andrew. That was fantastic. Thanks so much. Um, I think it was very valuable to share all that clinical experience and knowledge with us. So thank you so much for your logical explanation of fractures and all of that. I think everyone's learned something new today. So thank you very much. Um, I think everyone will probably agree that um, working with children, there's not never really like a textbook specific thing exactly like with grown-ups. It's a way easier to treat. So I've got a few questions lined up that we're going to go into. One of the first ones we've got is, what's the indications for surgery for spondylolisthesis in adolescents? Uh, that's a great question. So um, once you have the bilateral pars fractures, if there is um, separation that you see on the x-ray, we'll usually follow those along with periodic x-rays, so every six months or so. If there is progression of the slip, so you move, um, uh, the amount uh, is increasing over time, uh, that would be an indication. If it's more than 50% of the width of the vertebral body, that would be an indication. Certainly, if you have any neurologic um, abnormalities, that would be an indication. But the most common thing we see is just chronic pain and inability to play their sport. So if they've been treated for a period of time, um, conservatively, activity restriction, physical therapy, and their, their pain just persists and they can't play, then, then that, that's the most common indication we see. A lot of these are stable. And, and they don't need that, but, but the ones that, that hurt, I think, are the ones that most commonly get surgical treatment. Cool, thank you very much. Then the second question is, how does tendon pathology in adolescents affect the maturity and then have long-term effects for them later in life? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, there's certain conditions where it's very clear, like the slipped capital femoral epiphysis. If you see that, you know, that femoral head, even if it's slipped a little bit and we pin it in place, we know they're at risk for acetabular impingement, right? We know they're at risk for osteoarthritis. 
any of those physeal fractures that go into the joint, we know they're at risk for osteoarthritis later. Uh, I didn't talk a lot about ACL, but um, that's the biggest concern for us, even though the ACL injury in the child, I think is a, a relatively straightforward thing to fix now. Um, we worry that that sets them up for osteoarthritis again earlier um, than, than, than those who do it later. Um, but I think that the, the biggest problems are these kind of undiagnosed conditions where if you miss the ACL, if you miss the skiffy, uh, if you miss the fracture, um, that, that that is really what puts them at risk. Definitely. Thanks, Andrew. Then going on to that whole ACL thing, I mean, I think we all know there's a huge amount of increase in ACL injuries in younger athletes. And I think it brings us back to that whole thing about early sports specialization. Do you have any advice for us as clinicians on how to maybe work with coaches, with parents? Um, just, I mean, it's a big concern for us. So any advice on that? Yeah, so I would say a couple things. One is these uh, ACL entry prevention programs are, are available now for uh, our adolescents and our pre-adolescents, and they, they've done a good job in, in uh, setting them up so they can be incorporated into the warm-up. So if I have a, an adolescent female volleyball, soccer, uh, basketball team, I'm, I'm recommending that they start these programs, and they're, and they're free, so uh, there's, there's not a cost problem, and they're, they're – they're timely, so they can be used as part of the warm-up. So there's really not a good argument against doing it. It's just getting the information to the right people, primarily the coaches. Uh, as far as the, the sports specialization piece, it's a real problem for all sports all over the world. And um, I think Niru Gianthi has probably given us the, the best kind of data on what to recommend for people as far as like hours per week. And that is based on your age, you should not be participating in more hours per week than your age, which is a good kind of round number to use. So if you're 12 years old, you shouldn't be doing your activity more than 12 hours per week. Um, there, there, there is pretty good data now on overuse injury and specialization. I don't know that we have that same data for like ACL tear, but um, I really try to encourage um, athletes based on what we know from our collegiate athletes and their success. So the successful college athletes are usually the ones who specialize late. Um, and so passing that information down, I think is important for people to understand. There are a few exceptions like gymnastics and, and swimming where early specialization is probably required for you to be successful in your sport. But for most sports, at least at the college level, the successful athletes uh, are the ones who played multiple sports. Definitely. Thanks, Andrew. I think that's also true because a lot of these kids then have this perfectionistic mindset that they're often the ones that want to do more, they need to do more, and then they will train through those injuries. Do you have any, like, almost, not advice, but maybe if the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs in, let's say, in these kids, do you have any contraindications for using it in young athletes? Um, so that's a good question. You know, I think um, anti-inflammatories are controversial um, in general. You know, do we want to cover up pain to allow athletes to participate? Um, I don't think we see the sort of kidney problems that you see in adults with use of anti-inflammatories and certainly for endurance events where they're clearly contraindicated. Um, so, you know, normally what I'm using for them for is a, a brief sort of trial of treatment in order to calm the injury down. I do think what you see in, in younger athletes is true inflammation, whereas in some of our older athletes, you know, tendinopathy is probably the best example where it may not be inflammation. And so uh, if I'm using it, I certainly am using it for fracture care because it works very well and is better than a narcotic for treatment of fracture pain. And if I'm using it for overuse injury, in, in my mind, it's really until we address the physical therapy weaknesses uh, tightnesses that maybe we're going to treat their pain briefly. Perfect. Thanks so much, Andrew. Um, just do you have any thoughts on meniscal injuries in young adults? Uh, so, you know, um, I, I talked about a lot of things, but but uh, it was not comprehensive. And, and some of the things that we all deal with, like osteochondritis mm -hmm. desiccans or um, discoid meniscus, uh, I didn't address. And um, with 
uh, the discoid meniscus, it is a condition that is unique to adolescents and, um, um, and usually when they become symptomatic is in adolescence. So we don't see a lot of meniscal tears in the absence of ACL tears unless you have a discoid meniscus. So um, it, is a, it is something to be aware of and, and you can have discoid med medial meniscus, but that's much more rare. So just being aware of the discoid lateral meniscus uh, that can happen in isolation. Great. Thanks, Andrew. We're going to finish off with a last question, and I think it links up to all the other stuff. Is aside from the improvement of to strength and muscular function, what recommendations on volume and rehab would you recommend? Uh, so that's a great question. Um, so the challenge for all of us, I think, is if, if we have a physical therapist uh, that's used to dealing with children and the parent can get the child there and they can afford it, uh, it's an easy solution, right? But for most mm -hmm. of the, the situations, even in where I am, uh, either um, there's no pediatric trained person that's available, the parent can't get the child there, um, or they can't afford it. And so um, I think any of us, you know, in a school situation using coaches, um, in a community situation using coaches, if we have athletic trainers or biokineticists that work, work with teams, uh, all those resources um, are important, right? So um, I think making sure we get any, any of us who are working with children on the same page as far as that's concerned and understanding that, you know, strengthening in children is a good thing and that they can do it and it's safe and it's not going to affect their growth plates. Um, uh, body weight stuff, I think, is probably the best example that, that a lot of the exercises that that we can teach kids with body weight is totally appropriate. And so I think that can be done kind of across the board. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Andrew. Um, we're going to go to Robin now to just ask you a few things on research and all of that. But thank you so much for all the information shared. It was very valuable. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, thank you so much for your uh, presentation. It was really a great um, overview of everything. It was very nice and easy to follow. Certainly learned a lot. I've got a question with regards to um, seeing some of these patients, do you ever do any investigations like blood uh, laboratory investigations? Do you look at vitamin levels? Do you consider supplementation? It's a good question. So um, uh, as far as fracture goes, uh, the most common thing you see is vitamin D deficiency. And it's a, a problem particularly um, for those who are not in the sun a lot. And so depending on where you live, that may be more or less of an issue. Uh, so if I have a child who's had three fractures, then we will usually check vitamin D levels. Um, if I have um, a child who has a slipped capital femoral epiphysis, we know that these are oftentimes associated with endocrine abnormalities. So not only are we checking vitamin levels, but we're also checking thyroid. Um, and, and it may be um, uh, something that you even refer to an endocrinologist because there is such a high association. But I'd say the main thing that we're checking is vitamin D in the fracture situation. Sure, thanks. Um, you're at Vanderbilt University, and I know um, Fitz University has, has quite a link with Vanderbilt. And in particular, through these, um, these webinars and through our interest groups, we're trying to increase our, our research interest and research output. What are some of the things that you're perhaps involved in in your practice? Um, what are some of the uh, research um, programs that you guys have going on? Yeah, so with our various centers like the Concussion Center, we have a research arm of that. And so we have several projects ongoing. One is a, a saliva study to try to diagnose concussion from uh, saliva markers. Uh, we, we have um, uh, an ongoing project uh, looking at um, using uh, 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 sound waves going through the brain, which is a very interesting kind of idea. Uh, it's been used to diagnose increased intracranial pressure in, in patients in the ICU. And so uh, a couple of interesting things going on there on the concussion side. Um, on the injury prevention side, uh, Alex Diamond uh, leads that effort, and um, there are various projects ongoing looking at things like bullying and um, uh, mental health and, and those sorts of uh, coaching education uh, projects. So um, we try to do a periodic coaching education session now with COVID. Uh, that got canceled, and so... Uh, 
I think one of the positives that's coming out of this is these Zoom meetings, and now we can, you know, do these internationally, and we can do them with um, uh, locally with coaches, and, and, and probably we're going to reach more people because of that. So I think going forward, um, it's going to kind of open things up, and, and from a research world, the same way. You know, I think uh, it, it's forced us to kind of um, uh, catch up, maybe. Yes, learn to collaborate and yeah. do do things a little bit differently. Thanks for yeah. that. Uh, one final question before we let you get on with your holiday. Um, if anybody is to search for your name on Google, they'll, they'll see you standing with, at the Olympics in Rio with a couple of bronze medals around your neck. <laughs> I know that you were the team physician there. Um, yeah. Can you share some of your experiences with that? Uh, yeah, so uh, I was lucky to go with USA Volleyball to Rio with both the men's and the women's team. And, and I, I'll tell you, if, if you ever get the opportunity to go as a fan, as a volunteer, as a medical provider, uh, that you should go that the energy is just tremendous and um, you know Rio is a good example where I think there was a lot of fear going into it with Zika and some political unrest and and once you got there everybody puts all that aside and, and it really was just a great feeling you know the entire time and I'm, I'm sad that, that we don't get the Olympics this year in Japan yeah. um, and I look forward to it happening again next year and um, I know that they will put on a great show and, and even though, you know, it will affect some people's ability to have been there, um, uh, it'll be great. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I know these different events happen that are, that are not the Olympics around the world. So we have the Pan American games and, and I know, you know, the, the, the Commonwealth games, all these things, when these, you know, groups come together, just the feeling is, is really powerful. Fantastic. And for, for athletes, it's certainly something to work for. Yeah. Uh, we're going to leave it at that. Thank you so much for all your questions. While we um, are handing over to John, just to wrap up, I'd like to share a couple of slides here. Like I yeah, mentioned, gonna, I'll get out. Great. Cheers. Um, am, I, am I sharing my screen? Not yet. Um, like I mentioned at the beginning, um, Hine and I are in charge of a couple of interest groups. Um, so the first one is the young athlete or child athlete interest group. Please feel free, anyone out there, to email me um, if you're interested in joining, becoming a part of the group. And likewise for Hine, um, her email address is at the bottom there for the school sport interest group. Then to advertise a couple of our upcoming webinars. Uh, next week, Wednesday, we're talking about bone health particularly with regards to the female athletes. And thereafter, a couple of weeks later, we're talking about relative energy deficiency in sports. So we've got quite a few interesting webinars coming up. Um, and uh, we encourage you to, to follow WISH on Twitter, WITS Institute for Sport and Health on Facebook, and also WITS Sport on Twitter at WITS Sport. Thank you very much, Andrew. John, back to you. Great, thanks very much, Hene and Robin, for managing that process. And Andrew, really, uh, what a privilege to hear you present uh, in that very logical fashion. Uh, you don't see the WhatsApp messages that are coming through, just thanking us for inviting you. And, you know, I, I must just reiterate, it was a great honor and pleasure. I mean, I knew what to expect, but I don't think a lot of other people did. So really fantastic to see you again. Uh, hopefully we'll do it uh, in the same room again one day in the not too distant future. And whether it's through our university's collaboration or just you know, as colleagues, let's keep up the relationship and we would like to reciprocate one day as well. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks to all of you for supporting WISH and its initiatives. Thanks for SAS to SASMA for our association and with sport and to uh, Asina Lita for uh, their collaboration with WITS. Uh, we're really appreciative. And again, just as Robin said, some great webinars coming up. The emphasis is moving from the youth athlete now more to the women athlete. Some great uh, advice coming from local and overseas experts on bone health and on eating. And uh, I think you're going to get a lot out of those in the, in the next few weeks. So. Thank you to everyone. Thanks again to Andrew, Robin, and Hene. And have a good morning to Andrew and a good evening to everybody else here. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. Thanks, Robin. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, Robin. Thanks, Hene.
Top class, Andrew. Really appreciate that. Thank yeah. you very much. Yes, sir. Glad you're well.